Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and delighted to uh, welcome a returning, third time returning guest, Dr. Robert Oscar Lopez, who is the contributor to the new book, The New Normal, The Transgender Agenda. Uh, he says, despite repeated efforts by LGBT activists to equate love with toleration of sodomy, the New Testament provides clear definition of love which precludes sin. There is a growing move to normalize homosexuality and transgenderism, even within denominations, seminaries, and churches. Raised by two lesbians, he adopted a gay lifestyle and then came to faith in Messiah and left the gay lifestyle before embracing uh, God's design for marriage. He went on to earn his doctorate degree and now teaches at Southwestern Bible Theological. He says, unless churches are defending the biblical design for sexuality and marriage in the public square, then they're failing to defend the flock against LGBT activism. Dr. Robert Oscar Lopez, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Rabbi Walker. It's a pleasure to speak with you. It's good to see you again. Good to see less of you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I did lose a lot of weight since yes. the last time we good, spoke. Good, it's true. You know, normally we say we'd love to see more of you, but in this case, <laughs> we're thrilled to see less of you. Yeah. Uh, give us just a little snapshot. Uh, you were raised with uh, lesbian parents, um, which was your norm, uh, gay lifestyle, which was your norm. Uh, but then you, you came to faith and your whole perspective changed. How did that process unfold for you? I think I adapted to the situation that I found myself in when I was a young child. I was growing up with a mother who was in this relationship with a woman and I didn't have a father around. So uh, and my mother was very involved with the gay community behind the scenes. She had a mental health clinic. She was a psychiatrist. So I worked in her clinic from around the age of 12, so I had a lot of exposure and immersion in the issues that faced the gay and lesbian community because she had a lot of gay patients or people who were struggling with gay people in their family, and she also dealt with transvestites. So uh, I knew a lot about that, and it didn't feel abusive to me when I was initiated into sex at the age of 13 by two older teenage boys. I realized now looking backward that it was like abuse. It was an abusive event. And I got out of all this at the age of 28 when I realized that God had designed me to be with women because from what I know now, God designed men and women. He designed male and female, and that was all that he designed. He didn't design subcategories. And that's why I've become very vocal on these issues of transgenderism and homosexuality because I think both of them go against God's design in Genesis. Dr. Lopez, you and I have had many conversations in regards to this subject. Uh, you have several books out there which are outstanding works, and people are shocked when I say that there are only two races in the Bible, Jew and Gentile. Uh, but that is factual. Uh, that is exactly how God designed it. Otherwise, Ephesians 2 would have no merit from the two he shall make one. He clearly right. established that. And in every part of his blessings and covenant that he makes, it's always to be fruitful and multiply, both male and female. There mm -hmm. is no provision, both in the Old Testament or New Testament, for this agenda. This is a uh, Greek uh, eros, um, more of an Aristotle, if it feels good, do it kind of theology. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, uh, is the creep that has been slow but progressive into denominational Christianity and to the point where a work like The New Normal, The Transgender Agenda, has uh, contributors of uh, nine or ten people who all identify that this issue is becoming not uh, where it should be, which is a biblical issue, and the church should be resolved, resolute, uh, calling, uh, calling it what it is, which is unbiblical. Whether or not we label it in the category of sin or tie it to salvation, or all, it's just unbiblical. 
It's just not supported by the design of God. That should be sufficient enough to turn any person, self-described believer in Jesus and God's plan of salvation from it. And in fact, Acts chapter 15 speaks to it and says, if you want to know what of the Old Testament you're to carry forward, there's four things. And one of those four things is abstain from sexual immorality, which has already been predefined as same-sex encounters. Correct, correct, right. So what do we do? How do we address this? How do we tackle the fact that right now or in just a couple of months, the Methodist Church, the second largest or third largest in denomination in all of North America, of all of Christendom, is going to vote as to whether or not they're going to let anybody do what they want to do, whether or not they're going to support gay and lesbian ordination and gay and lesbian marriage. This is now becoming a denominational issue and is causing quite a stir. Well, the most important thing to remember is that Jesus Christ told us this was going to happen. And in his parables and in his statements, he made, he gave us a really clear roadmap, number one, for why a lot of these trends are so egregiously wrong and also what to do about them. Remember, he said to beware the people who wear long robes and like to have long tassels on their robes and like the seat of honor at the banquets and want to be greeted at the marketplace. That's really the core issue with the encroachment of this theology into the churches. We got into a situation where denominations, and then in the case of the Holy Catholic Church, the entire structure of the magisterium, it gave this exalted place to scholars and people who had degrees and people who had uh, chairs and offices and you know uh, positions of high respect. And, and that's really the problem because the seminaries became very entangled with the secular universities. So the last book that I wrote, Wackos, Thugs, and Perverts, was about the universities and ultimately the, the new normal kind of charts the progression of that because as the universities become totally corrupted then now they're going and infecting the seminaries because the same body of research the same personnel the same pool of people who are experts who get degrees from a divinity school like Columbia or Yale then they go and they teach in a denominational div uh, seminary and they're passing along this same false theology if I can summarize the false theology in just uh, the most basic terms, uh, what they do is, because these people are very intelligent and they're good writers, and as Romans tells us you know, in Paul's letter to the Romans, that thinking themselves wise, they became fools. What, what, what this theology boils down to is if you can take some scripture and take a kernel of truth in it, all right, and then you just sort of decorate it, you glaze it over with a bunch of really contrived falsehoods, but you state it with vehemence and you state it with uh, an air of prestige, then you can get people to sign on to anything. Almost anything becomes a gospel issue because you're, you've, you're avoiding the process, which is so important in the Bible, where we discern, where we look at what is truthful in a statement or a position and what is wrong. There, Jesus Christ does say we need to be discerning. He warns against the blind leading the blind into a pit. He says you have to separate the shepherds from the hirelings, the people who are not going to stay by the flock. And so with gender and sexuality, this has become, I would say, the center point, the focal point for the great apostasy and the falling away right now because of the fact that people have taken a very simple passage in Genesis, which is straightforward, it's unequivocal. God created Adam, male, and Eve, female, and because of this, a man will leave the home of his mother and father and cleave to his wife to become one flesh. It's very clear that the creation of Adam and Eve was not just a singular, unrelated historical event. It was an event that laid down the design for our bodies. We are to become one flesh. I know that we talk a lot about the prohibition against homosexuality. I'm trying to focus a lot now on the mandate for heterosexuality. God wants us to find a member of the opposite sex and to mate with that person, to deliver our gifts 
to that person to give them pleasure and companionship. And yes, not just procreation of children, but that togetherness and the joy of the, the marriage bed. There's an entire chapter of the Bible, the Song of Songs, about the joy of sex. Yes, it's true that Jesus Christ talks about eunuchs, and Paul talks about people who are gifted with celibacy, but there is a design that God had for us. He designed our bodies to fit together in a specific way with one member of the opposite sex. And Jesus Christ did make many statements in the New Testament that sort of um, uh, brought a new kind of covenant where the Sabbath could be kind of renegotiated or the, the traditional Jewish laws about eating but he reaffirmed the importance of Genesis. And when he talked about the Ten Commandments, he never hesitated or refrained from naming um, honor thy mother and thy father, and thou shalt not commit adultery, both of which go back to this mandate for a heterosexual model for the family. But what these experts have done is they have taken what is a very basic, very clear, very unequivocal model and they have laid it over with all of these questions about what the translations really mean. And, uh, well, what do we do with it? They, they, a lot of times what they do is they move the debate to a debate about the prohibitions. So they say, Sodom 19, you know, in Genesis 19, the destruction of Sodom, maybe that really wasn't about homosexuality. Maybe it was about rape. Ezekiel talks about Sodom as being arrogant and not taking care of the poor. So they cast doubts on that. And then they say, Leviticus, a man shall not lie with a man the way he lies with the woman. Well, but, you know, we don't follow the, the orders about shellfish. So why should we order follow the orders about this? They cast doubt. They chip away at it, at the prohibitions. But I think the key thing, Rabbi Walker, the mistake that we made as Christians defending God's design is we, we never got the conversation back to the mandate. The mandate is for heterosexuality. God never gives anything approaching a mandate for a man to find sexual pleasure, physical pleasure with the body of another man. That is nowhere does God tell you to do that. And remember in Mark 8, when Jesus says to Peter himself, get thee behind me, Satan, you think of man's concerns, not of God's. God, if God never told us to do it, don't do it. In this uh, collaborative work of uh, many of these contributors, did you have the opportunity to sit down with these other contributors, or was this a mailed-in kind of, uh, of uh, compendium? No, these are people that were all, we shared the same concerns, we knew each other, we organized a conference in London in uh, November 2016, and it was called um, The New Normal, and we brought, we were really focused on the impact on children. So if you'll notice there's a real uh, concern with children in a lot of the work that is compiled there, but these were all people who presented at that conference. It was a well-attended conference, it was an exciting event, and we felt that we really wanted to build on that energy by collecting the essays and then putting them out as a publication. I think the one thing that I feel really great about with the new normal is that I think it adds a certain vehemence and urgency and breadth to the discussion that we don't always get in the United States. And so I really wish that the book would get more circulation in the United States. That's one of the reasons why I'm going on the circuit and trying to, to speak to people about it, uh, because the Wilberforce Press, which they, they published it in London, is a great resource. Uh, they're tied to the Christian concern there. And a lot of their work, I think, would help to complement some of the work that we get here in the U.S. But, in, in, you know, um, we've got to do the work of spreading the word. So you have some contributors like, for instance, Carlos Flores and James Lopez. Uh, they're a little bit younger. I, I basically discipled them when I was in California. I worked with them when they were at UC Santa Barbara and at Biola. And then you have people who are much more established scholars like Julia Gasper, who did the chapter on literature and on the literary part of it. We wanted to bring together literary experts and scientists. So we had the doctors talking about the medical end of it and the theologians. John Nolan uh, contributes great work there on the theology behind this, as does Karis Mosley. Uh, there is uh, somewhat of a framework that is very relevant to the Anglican Church because it was done in Church of England uh, territory, if you will, and because a lot of us were involved in the fight 
over transgenderism and homosexuality in the Anglican Church. But many of the contributors are from other faiths. We even have one Catholic there that I know of, Carlos Flores, and we have an Orthodox Jewish woman, uh, Brittany Klein, who contributed some work to it. So I think we're coming from a lot of different faith perspectives, but we all are concerned with the idea that the LGBT movement, which we have seen steamroll the military and the schools and the courts and the culture, now is not even flinching as it moves into the churches. And the success that they have had of moving into the churches and forcing this work theology at the highest levels of the churches, because what we've seen is it usually is top down. It's usually at the denominational level. They take over co uh, committees or governance boards. Uh, they have really great publicists who put out talking points. So when there's general assemblies or annual conventions, they get the denomination to adopt resolutions where a lot of the average people don't even know what's going on. And then before you know it, it's in your church. It's at vacation Bible school. It's in the materials that are printed for Sunday school. I saw one for instance, one very conservative church was using material that was trying to teach Exodus to children, and they had replaced thou shalt respect thy mother and thy father with thou shalt respect your parents, which obviously is a bow to the same-sex parenting movement. And see, things like that, that people don't even know how this is getting into there. And the transgender uh, debate brings it to a whole new level, because with the transgender debate, now you're talking about playing with the pronouns for God and even for Jesus, where they try to make these people seem like gen gender neutral. And, um, and so you're, you're really, that's where the collection came from. And um, while we do bring in science and we bring in politics, we also want very much for the churches to be on notice that this is coming to a church near you right now. The churches that seem to be embracing uh, this narrative of same-sex marriage, <clears throat> uh, it, it's almost as if because they were not equipped whatsoever to address the issue, they acquiesced to the issue by saying we're to be welcoming to all people, we're to be a house of prayer for all nations, we're to find a way to uh, embrace uh, the person and through the administration of love, acceptance, no condemnation, uh, go down the list of all the things that build a healthy flock. But then uh, we don't let thieves steal from the offering plate. We don't let adulterers go into another room with a married woman and right. support that as behavior. We don't let somebody walk into a church with a knife and stab somebody but yet will allow for the advancement of an agenda. And I don't think that the pastorate feels equipped to in any way, shape, or form address it. And therefore, because of that, they take the position that if I don't accept it, then I'm rejecting it. And rejection is not a part of the gospel message. Well, yeah, right, because the terms have come from the world. They haven't come from the church or they haven't come from the holy text. The, I try to start all discussions, either whether it's trans or gay, I start out by saying, you are not gay, you are not trans, these are not identities. Nobody is trans, nobody is gay. God created all of us, male or female, all right? To part of what it is to be male is to have a body that is designed to become one flesh with a female, even if it never happens, even if you spend your whole life celibate and you die a virgin, you are in a body that was designed to be with a woman. So homosexuality is out the window. Trans is out the window. You, God created your body with a male body. Even if you like to listen to Broadway musicals, even if you like the color pink, you know, there are parts of the Bible that say you shouldn't dress like a woman, but even if it's a little bit less direct than that, it doesn't matter. You're still a man. You're a man who likes musicals. You're a man who likes to dance in the ballet or something like that. You're not a woman. Okay, so both of these things are wrong. But what's happening is the church is not able to uh, articulate a counter definition of identity. Our identity comes from God. We are created by God a certain way, and we become a new creation when we find Christ. That is where identity comes from. But the problem is that we're allowing the world 
to get this idea of being, the ontology, the essence of a person being defined by their gender presentation or by what they do with their body to have uh, sexual pleasure. And that, I think, is where the church failed. Because once someone comes into your church and says, I am gay, can I join your church? If you don't stop at the very front end and say, you are not gay, you can join our church, but first you have to understand you are not gay. That is a statement that's false. God hates lies. Jesus Christ said that what comes out of your mouth defiles you because it comes from the heart. So if you're saying, I am gay, that sounds like there is a distortion, a perversion, a sexual immorality that is residing in your heart. You've got to stop saying that. You've got to clean out your heart, and you've got to stop defiling yourself. But yes, you are welcome to be part of the church, but that's going to be part of the process. If you surrender to the idea that this is who they are, then eventually you're going to end up at the heresy that God made them that way and that there's no way to change them. And then the entire theology falls apart. Because if you believe that God made people gay, you don't believe Genesis, the first book of the Bible. The rest of the book doesn't make any sense. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, uh, it, it's, so that's where we're at. And the church doesn't seem to articulate that. They, they don't stand up to this dominant narrative that we're getting from the world around us that somehow people are this way. It, it's inevitable that if you don't fight that essentialism right out of the gate, you're going to end up accepting the heresy that God made people gay or trans. So, and, and then your theology will fall apart. You bring a, a great deal of clarity to the statement of stopping it at the very mention and reframing it, which is incredibly important. We're talking to Dr. Robert Oscar Lopez, one of the contributors to The New Normal, The Transgender Agenda. This was an outcropping of a conference that was done in England with many very notable authors who have shared their presentation and one that every person in ministry, any person who is really looking for an understanding of how to reframe this dialogue needs to be equipped to have the same conviction, the same words, the same presentation that Dr. Lopez has. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to dig more into the content of the new normal, the transgender agenda. We'll be right back. back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Igniting a Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, We've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www dot ianbn dot com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. 
The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, Prophecy in the News videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Dr. <coughs> uh, Robert Oscar Lopez, who is one of the contributors to a new book entitled The New Normal, The Transgender Agenda. Dr. Lopez, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, take us, if you will, through, uh, I know that this is a series of presentations, but <clears throat> the presentations uh, in and of themselves, which are compiles, which makes this book, uh, is what makes this book so unique, so relevant, and so equipping, because it does address the how-to, yeah. not just the what-to, or not just here's a diatribe about what's wrong, but it mm -hmm. also plots out a path for course correction and puts in the hands of pastors, ministers, counselors, or other individuals that have these concerns uh, in how to handle and what to do about this looming issue. Uh, help summarize for us some of the contributions to this book. Well, we can start first with Karis Mosley, who's a really great theologian, who's done a lot of work with the Church of England and the Church of Scotland. Uh, she's also an expert in a lot of the languages involved, and she goes over the history of the Church's struggle with these sexual radical movements. There's actually a very long history, going back to the Gnostics and earlier, of different heresies, different heretical movements within the church, trying to redefine gender and redefine sex. Uh, and she goes over that and she talks about how the church has dealt with it in the past, which I think is good because it gives denominations ammunition when they have to face a lot of the pressures to try to change the doctrine in the church or to change liturgical practice. She can help you with that. Um, she also has a history of how transsexualism encroached so quick, quickly in Great Britain into the government and into health care. So she gives a, a lay of the land so that we can understand how the trans movement ends up getting funding, getting support, getting government buy-in so that it becomes this movement that seems all of a sudden like it's institutionalized and it's almost impossible to stop. 
I would really recommend the chapter by Peter Saunders as well, because he is a Christian physician with the Christian Medical Fellowship, and he talks about what's so wrong medically uh, with these procedures. And that goes along well with the contribution by Carlos Flores, who's a philosopher who talks about the philosophy of medical ethics and why transgender transition procedures are actually not only not medicine, but they're contrary to medicine. They're, they're, they're an anti-medicine. Uh, if you will, almost like a poison. Um, Daniel Moody also talks about what, how to deal with this in social situations when people say, I am trans. How do you respond in a way that is, you know, I hate to overuse the word compassionate, but we want to have some way that's effective that doesn't just become sort of emotional abuse of someone who's saying something we clearly disagree with and we know is wrong, but how do you deal with it in a way that's redemptive and uplifting? I have a chapter in there that I call Chaste is the New Queer, in which I argue that queerness, from what I understood it in the early 1990s, was supposed to signify a resistance to dominant oppressive definitions of sexuality. That to be queer meant to stand against the state, it meant to stand against the forces of capitalism, and to stand against the pressure of those who would bully and suppress you, and to try to force you into a normative form of sexual pleasure. What I argue in that chapter is that actually chastity, Christian chastity, is the new queer because it is the people who are promoting chastity who are actually now standing up to the government, they're standing up to the bullies, they're standing up to corporate America. It's actually corporate America that is completely in bed with the LGBT movement and with queerness because it's really a kind of a form of capitalism. You sell people what they want. You uh, give them what they want, and you punish anyone who can defy their access to immediate gratification. It also turns people into commodities, because just as the Christian social justice movement talks a lot about helping the poor and fighting the forces of greed and exploitation, uh, we also have to fight against the, the damage caused by lust. When you give yourself over to lustful pleasures, often you trample upon and disregard the harm that you cause other people. So uh, these are all uh, essays of the book that fit together kind of like pieces in a puzzle where we're looking at politics, theology, and medicine so people can understand, number one, how grave this development is, how pervasive it is, and also how it's been handled before in history and how we can do it again. You talked about the beginnings of this going back to the Gospels, uh, the Greek uh, lifestyle was <clears throat> quite erotic. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, if we examine, uh, and I've been asked this question before because uh, of my Jewish background is uh, how do I address the statement that men should not pray with their head covered? And as I looked at the statement, as I looked at the context, as I looked at the uh, uh, life and times of who this was being addressed to, the only conclusion I could draw was that since men played female roles in plays, men uh, adorned themselves in women's clothing, that hair was referred to in the Old Testament as a woman's covering that this was a reference to <clears throat> a transvestite. And people would look at me and say, well, how could you come to that conclusion? I said, I just explained to you the progression of my logic and my reasoning as mm -hmm. to why and to the society that Paul was writing to. I can think of no other, uh, and I've had this dialogue with other people, and they say, you know, I can't think of any other reference either. The Pope has his head covered. The cardinals wear a mitre, their heads covered. Uh, the rabbi wears a kippah and a tallit, his head is covered. Uh, we're not talking about uh, religious coverings, what covering, uh, so we have to look at biblically consistent references, and hair was a woman's covering. So when we see this statement, which seems kind of random, he's addressing lifestyle issues, he's addressing lifestyle choices, we see the concept of lover of self, and every message I ever hear says, oh, that's pride. And 
I look at it and say, no, pride has its own word. Pride has its own reference. Pride has its own context. Lover of self, uh, could that not mean I like what I see in the mirror? I become a lover of self, male to male, female mm -hmm. to female. And have we uh, watered down some of the gospel message and some of the letters of Paul into a convenient 21st century interpretation or application without looking at the reality <clears throat> of the lifestyles of what he was addressing apostolically of saying, look, here's some behaviors that are carrying over into what's becoming the church that we ought not to be doing, uh, that the world does, we ought not to be doing that in the church. Um, from your scholarly opinion, am I that far off? I think that you're on to something there. I think you're on the right path. The, the scripture that I would point to is God shall not be mocked. You know, you're not going to be able to get away with mocking God. So uh, the parts of the scripture that give us clear instructions that sometimes uh, maybe leave a, a little bit of wiggle room open for those devious, mischievous people who want to try to twist around the words, they're playing a game. God knows you're playing a game. Those of us who are steeped in the word and are reading the totality of the Bible, generally, if we think about it, we can tell that you're playing a game. And so you should avoid playing games. If, if it's clear that the consistency throughout the Bible is that men should respect the role that God gave them, that God designed them to be a certain way, even as some of the less consequential parts of culture change and maybe men go from wearing tunics to wearing trousers, the common sense can tell you that whatever uh, being a man generally means, without having to get too much of, of a fine point on it, respect it. Respect what your role is, particularly in relation to women. You're supposed to be the protector. You're supposed to respect the woman's role as the, the mother um, and as the, the nurturer in the house. There are many parts of the Bible we could point to with that. That doesn't mean that we have to have a really oppressive family structure where women are treated like chattel. Obviously, there are parts of the, the scripture that would uh, resist that, but it clearly says in Deuteronomy, a man will not take on a woman's clothes. And it's, it's placed perhaps in vague enough terms so that as things change from the, the dressing practices of the Near East in, in you know, 2000 BC uh, towards the Roman period, and then you're going through the medieval and the modern world, Clothing styles are going to change, but the idea that there's male and female, that won't change. So God will not be mocked. Don't try to play games with it. I think if you just look at that, for instance, and the, a basic reading of history, because there's enough history that you can do just a few layers away from the Bible, will tell you that, yeah, homosexuality has been with us from the beginning. There's a reason why it comes up in the 19th chapter of Genesis. It's already there. I mean, that's the first book of the Bible. This is very early history. And we already see an entire city given over to it. So God knows that we have the capacity of knowing what he means and what his word means when there are references to homosexuality and cross-dressing. And I, I would take that passage about men not covering their heads within that same context. It's, I, I don't think it requires a lot of feats of logic. Uh, it's good if you know the ancient languages. I've, I've studied Greek, but I think you can get to it if you trust just some basic translators, you don't have to get very complicated. So here we're faced with a, um, <clears throat> a family situation. Mom and dad come home and uh, son, daughter says, Mom, dad, there's something I need to tell you. Might be Sunday right after church. Um, uh, I'm in a uh, relationship with a, I'm a woman, I'm in a relationship with a woman, and I believe this is who I want to spend the rest of my life with. So they look to each other and they say, well, we've got to pray about this. They call the pastor, and the pastor says, um, uh, bring her in for counseling, or let me refer you to somebody. We don't have a whole toolbox of answers uh, because mom and dad are not going to reject their child, uh, you, you would think. Uh, they would be, uh, and, and that's where some of the advocacy comes from. I've seen it in the Jewish community 
uh, <clears throat> pretty universally on two major issues, abortion and on homosexuality, uh, both because they deal with the family not being broken because of somebody's lifestyle choices. So mm -hmm. you see an advocacy that is in defense of uh, I'm going to love my child no matter what uh, and supporting and embracing through grit teeth and through every kind of discomfort but not wanting to reject their child. How do we balance that? Uh, and should we be willing to make that decision that says, I would rather lose you for a moment than lose you for eternity? And have we made sexuality the sin du jour and have put an incredible amount of focus into this one area when uh, sexual sin is of no greater importance in the Bible than any other sin. It is no lesser in the Bible than any other sin. Uh, how did we get it to become this major focal point where we have so much discussion revolving around this one particular area that fits into the category of sin? Well, I think it is a big part of our lives. Uh, I, I do think it is, sin uh, is a very, very broad label, and I think sexual sins do get somewhat of a, they're shaped, they're contoured a little bit differently, uh, partly because it's, sex is an area of so much, what I would say is humility. God keeps us humble, I believe, this is my interpretation, by the way that he designed the male and female body. A man can be incredibly muscular, he can go out and he can win wars and become president of the United States and he still might not be able to perform in the bedroom. God keeps a lot of things out of our control in the realm of sex. So it's a, a place of incredible anxiety, but per, maybe that serves a purpose. You know, maybe God wants us to be humbled. He wants us to be born knowing what sex we are, but not knowing who our marriage partner is going to be and when that person's ever going to get there. And then once you're married, you don't know which incident of sexual intercourse is actually going to succeed in, in creating a pregnancy. You can't control it. God controls it. So because of that, I think uh, the other human sins like pride and impatience and um, resentment and envy and covetousness, all of those enter into the sexual arena. So it really becomes, I would say, uh, a focal point, a touchstone for a lot of sexual sins. Now, having said that, I think there's no silver bullet answer as to what to do when your kid comes home and says, I'm trans or I'm gay. There's just no easy answer. I wish there were. This is the question that I get everywhere I go when I go to churches. People want to know what to say to people. Um, there's no easy way to get them to all of a sudden discover th what, that God's design is different from what they're doing and to have them love you also at the same time and, and to come to Christ. It's great if you can do that, but chances are 99 times out of 100, you're going to be experiencing a lot of roadblocks and it's not going to work. As a parent, here's what I will say. Um, heterosexual boys, teenage boys who are 15 years old, don't get to come home and say to mom, hi, I'm going to sleep with 17 different girls this year. I'm going to go hire a hooker. Um, and you, you, I'm going to keep on doing this and I get to live at home and have you feed me and do my laundry and I'm going to stay here on your dime. What would your mother say if you had said that when you were 17? Even my mother, a lesbian, would have said, you're out on your ear, okay? There's no guarantee that you're going to be able to live rent-free in a home with your parents when you're at an age when your parents know you're too young to be making these decisions about yourself. I think it is totally within the, the scope of a parent's responsibility and their prerogatives to say you will not be engaged in gay relationships. If you're feeling like you can't hang out with gay people without wanting to get into a gay relationship, you're not going to hang out with gay people while you're in my, uh, in my house and living under my roof. If you're 17 and you feel like this is more important than living by your parents' instructions, then go and get a job and get an apartment. It might be a small apartment in a kind of rundown part of town, but these are the choices that you make. I am flabbergasted when I see people being persuaded emotionally by these statistics that are released by the gay community that say that there are all these homeless gay teens who have been put out by their parents because their parents won't let them have gay sex. 
what age are we talking about here? If we're talking about 16, 17, 18, I was already an emancipated minor by the age of 17. I, I don't have much sympathy for a 19-year-old homeless teen who just wanted to be able to live in his mom's house and have gay sex. It's your mom's house. If she says no, then you have to live by those rules. We're getting... It, this is God shall not be mocked territory. We're, we're, we're playing games with our language. We're playing games with our social relationships. And the answer to me is fairly obvious. Okay, when you're the child, you have to honor your parents and your parents' rules. Honor thy mother and thy father in, in the Ten Commandments. And just like any other uh, child, I don't think any 14 or 15-year-old girl will be able to come home and say, hi, mom, I'm having sex with a 19-year-old boy. Is that okay? No, of course it's not okay. I mean, parents set guidelines and rules that include what you're going to be doing sexually because they know more than you do. And they know that We've all been teenagers. I mean, Rabbi Walker, you were a teenager once, weren't you? You didn't come out of the womb at the age you're at now. No. I mean, think of all of the ridiculous, crazy ideas you had when you were a teenager. I remember I thought I was going to work for the UN and become a translator. I mean, that never happened, right? You have all of these crazy ideas that you have at that age, and parents need to be in there and, and defining boundaries. Um, you know, I think that there is a certain sense that this LGBT movement has been so successful at getting into the schools that they have this pipeline to the youth that they never should have had. And, and we've got to work concertedly. We have to work as a movement to shatter that pipeline. These people, these activists and teachers who have been uh, brainwashed by these activists should not be having conversations with our children and giving their, our children ideas about sexual morality. It shouldn't be happening, and, and this has got to stop. The public school system is complicit in this uh, advancement of a sexual identity, even to the point of the ridiculous where I read one article that said that you should ask your baby for permission before you change its diaper. Uh, this this kind of 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 yeah. uh, you know establishing their identity and their ability to give permission uh, mm -hmm. sets the whole parent child paradigm on its heels, uh, and then you start moving it to the school district is going to help your child determine their sexual identity by surveying them, asking them questions. Do you feel like a boy? Do you feel like you're a girl? Exactly. exactly. And they don't, they don't, this whole idea that you're, the parents have to ask for the kids' permission, you'll notice how school teachers and school counselors are not expected to show all this deference to the child's wishes. You don't ask the child, do you want to learn about homosexuality? No, you make them sit in the classroom and listen. You, you forbid them from asking obnoxious questions or perhaps any questions at all. You test them on it and then give them a grade based on the answers they provide. And then you hold up their ability to, to advance to the next grade level based on it. I, I mean, it's very coercive. It's just simply disrespectful to traditional parents. You know, I mean, if, if I could tell you all of the statements that have been made about how children are supposed to react to gay parents, it's completely the opposite. You're supposed to be a, a, a happy, smiling, unquestioning slave if one of your parents is gay. And, you know, and you're not supposed to question the divorce or why it is that they went to a sperm bank to have you conceived. The fact that they paid money to have you in the home. I mean, all of those things are beyond. You can't question those things. That's disrespectful to your parents. But if you're a child of two Christian heterosexual parents, you can reject them for any reason under the world because they, they won't let you do this or they won't let you do that. It, it's completely distorted. It's very, very muddled. And I do want to add one caveat to what you said earlier. It's true that the public schools are being involved in this, but in England we're seeing Anglican schools, Christian schools, are imposing the, the exact same terms. I know of Catholic schools, not only colleges, but now K through 12 that are involved in this exact type of thing where people pay to have their kids go to a Catholic school and they're in fourth or fifth grade and the Catholic school teacher says I'm in a gay marriage and they bring pictures of their spouse and all and then if the Catholic school wants to discipline or dismiss that teacher it becomes a huge scandal I mean they're trying really hard to get this message to children even in religious contexts so You've got to be really firm in your convictions and your understanding of why this is abusive, why it's against God's design. You have to be ready for confrontation, even in your churches. 
I know of many stories of uh, church nurseries and church youth ministries where a lot of this pro-gay uh, rhetoric is coming into play. You know, people that don't understand that they're dropping their kids off in some of these programs and they there's really not much guarantee unless you check it out for yourself that this is going to be truly biblical. People are afraid to bring it up. People are afraid to address it before the pastor, before the board. Denominationally, you're having these conferences where they're even openly discussing the pros and cons of same-sex marriage or in ordination of people who are openly in defiance of God's word. It is an incredibly confusing message and it is a blot on the gospel message. And I can tell you that it is a deterrent uh, to people coming to faith when they look at this battle that's going on within the church as to whether or not the church should embrace something that is so blatantly prohibited mm -hmm. in the Bible. Well, and the Catholic Church went through this where in the 1960s and 1970s they loosened up their uh, attitude a little bit and they let a lot of people into the seminaries who said, well, I'm, I'm homosexual but I won't act on it. And then it's not a coincidence that 20 or 30 years later there are all these stories of teenage males being involved in sexual uh, indiscretions and sexual misconduct perpetrated by uh, Catholic priests who were homosexual. A lot of them were homosexual. People try to make it seem as though this wasn't a gay issue, but it was. So it, it, to me, it, it, it really boggles the mind that uh, Christian denominations, uh, the Protestant denominations, would go down this exact same road as if we don't have any historical reference point. Of, of course, you don't want to have conferences like the one that's going to be taking place this fall where there are a group of a lot of these gay rights organizations, they've organized a conference teaching people how to connect directly with youth ministers in evangelical churches, work around the pastors, work around the deacons, connect with the youth ministers and get them the pro-gay material in their hands so they can provide gay welcoming content, religious, supposedly religious content to youth. I mean, we're talking about 14-year-olds in churches. Do you think that that's not going to result in sexual indiscretions and sexual misconduct? I mean, yeah. how old are the youth pastors? They're talking about sex in church without their parents' knowledge, without the pastor's knowledge. This is really bad territory. And the fact that it has made it so far to the churches, I think is a sign that God is, um, he's upset with us, all right? And this is part of the chastening. This is part of us uh, being told, you know, you, you stayed silent for so long, you, you were asleep at the wheel, and now you've got to wake up and take control of this. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but we've been talking with Dr. Lopez, Dr. Robert Oscar Lopez, who's one of the contributors of The New Normal, The Transgender Agenda, I think is a must read for anybody that's looking at their church, looking at leadership, looking at what decisions need to be made. It's an open and very comprehensive dialogue, a number of extremely important opinions that need to be heard. Dr. Lopez, always welcome here on Revealing the Truth. So great to see you. May God bless you and all the works of your hand. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.